So uh, I may do that, and then you can just download. You know, if you come in 20 minutes late, you can just download the first third. And, uh, but I'm not sure. So you know, we're we're working on this first time we've done this. So we'll see. But. They're there for you. They'll download faster on campus, I think, than at home. That works. You know, those connections are generally better. All right, so let's see. Uh, no no open questions we need to deal with first? All right. We've only got two things so far. Uh, well, not, not in this order, in reverse order, but uh, the only two things we've got stress and strain. We're working with with some very, very uh, simple, very straightforward ideas. We've looked at the possibility that uh, an object of some length, say L, can be loaded in some way, whether it's compression or in uh, tension, doesn't really matter. We'll work with uh, tension today just because of, uh, of what's going to follow. But it doesn't matter. It can be done either way. Um, so we'll, we, can, we can load some object. And we've looked at the fact that depending upon what the cross section is that's supporting this load, we get some idea of what the stress is then in the material. And that's just simply the ratio of the load that's being supported by that area. We also looked at the, the deformative response of this material to, for example, here, a, a tension. That there's the possibility that the material will elongate by some distance del. Greatly exaggerated here, of course. Well, I guess it could be. <coughs> um, you know, if it's a, it's a pretty elastic material, uh, a pretty stretchy material like uh, like rubber, or happens to be very thin, or both. It could actually deform by that that kind of margin. Uh, but then we looked at the uh, the strain in the material. as the actual deformation itself. Uh, notice that that's independent of that cross-sectional area. It's also independent, um, at least that value itself is independent of the load um, that's being opposed on it. So we're going to get to the point today where we're going to put these two together. And if I had $50,000, we'd actually do this. But I can't justify $50,000 for a one-day demonstration. So we'll just talk through the demonstration. Um, it's, it's a very straightforward one, so it's a very easy one to imagine. But it is kind of fun to do it. Uh, well, it's, I'll tell you why it's fun to do it when we get there. Uh, so imagine we take... Uh, a, some kind of engineering material and we'll look at a sample piece of this and the sample piece will look something like this in that at the top and the bottom it's got some uh, some threaded portion and then it narrows down to a very standard test length in here where we have a constant cross section. So that will be our, our cross sectional area A and we'll have in there a test length L. Between this L or, or during this, this this test length L, it is a constant cross section. And the reason uh, it necks down like that to this narrower region is so that that indeed is the test region. Everywhere else, 
there's a bigger cross-sectional area. So um, we know that that if the cross-sectional area gets bigger, the stress gets smaller. So in this way, with this being the minimum cross-sectional region, we have the maximum stress in that region. So that, that focuses the test on just that piece. Uh, everything outside of that is going to be at a lower stress and um, so is not going to be the area of concern. That way, now we, we have a, a focus on this narrow cross-sectional region area and we have a test length there. So we've, we've essentially set, fixed these two values with that test piece. Then the threaded parts, we clamp into some machine. And now we can use that machine to either start pulling the piece apart if we want to test it in tension, or we can start compressing it if we want to test it in compression. And this is a, a very standard set size piece of material. <laughs> and uh, can be ordered in all kinds of different engineering materials, different types of steel alloys, different types of aluminums, uh, all kinds of different things, anything we want to test, any material we want to test. And in fact, a manufacturer will do this for us. If we're going to order um, some A36 structural steel I-beams, then we trust that the manufacturer has taken some of that A36 steel and tested it for us and will publish for us the results we're about to look at now. So we're going to take this test piece. We can run it in compression or to, uh, tension. We'll run it in tension just because I've already pictured that. So the the machine will put this piece under increasing tension. As it does so, it can monitor two things for us, of course. Uh, as the force increases, we already know what the cross-sectional area is because that's standard for a test piece. So it's, uh, it's something uh, you can just, you can, you can buy these test pieces, read off the cross-sectional area and enter it into the machine. So the machine will apply a force P, will have entered into it the value of the cross-sectional area from the test piece, so the machine will actually measure then for us the stress in the piece. Pretty convenient. So the machine will put out a big graph for us. Um, also, the machine will already know what the length is because we can, we can type that in uh, as, as part of a, the initiation of the machine. You know, you, you start at the machine and the first thing it does is ask you, I guess, for the area of the test piece and the length of the test section. It's usually very standard, maybe an inch or uh, depends on the size of the machine. And as the machine applies this load, it notices that its two clamped jaws there will start getting farther apart. Well, that's what del is then. So the machine will be able to measure del, already knows what L is. It will calculate then as well as it does this test, the strain in the material. Just uh, very easy for a machine to know what the P is, thus know what the stress is, to know what the the test length is, thus know what the strain is automatically. And so that it'll put out for us a graph of stress on the x-axis, strain on the um, y, uh, sorry, strain on the x-axis, stress on the y-axis. Uh, in a way, if you look at it, um, this is the load being put on the material. The stress is the load being put on the material. The strain is the material strong response to that load. Notice here's, here in here is our load. 
and here is our response to that load, the actual deformation there. And so it's very easy then to, to put in those input values, turn on the machine, and let it start applying some load. Very little load at first, and then it gets greater and greater and greater, and we see what the material response to that is. This is, this is done, this is where all these values in the back of the book are, and we'll look at them in some detail in a second. So to start with, our, our material will take a lot of load and not very much response yet. So we're, uh, we're just putting in some load. It's pretty easy to increase that load and the material really doesn't respond yet very much. So we, we keep it going. And in fact, for quite some time, we find that this is a linear response. As we increase the load, as determined in the stress for the machine and its output, there's just not that much response yet. That's no different than you grabbing a piece of the metal and trying to put, a, put some effort into it and it's, it's not going to do very much. And in fact, uh, as we're going to find, uh, I have to exaggerate this part of the graph just to get it on here. It's really extremely steep and almost right up along the y-axis. Uh, I have to exaggerate at him uh, here. Uh, we're going to have to change scales as we go here because what happens later would compress this so much that we can't even tell the difference between it and the y-axis. Continues on for uh, a good linear portion here where the stress is directly proportional to the strain as this load is being increased. Not very much strain response yet. The material is just not, not, uh, not increasing that much. And we could run this, we could run this test right here if I happen to have it, uh, the $50,000. However, right about now, <coughs> most of you are feeling what a great chance to take a coffee break. So we decide, let's turn off the machine and we'll come back in a little bit while we're all going to go out for coffee. Um, who came in? Frank came in last, so he's buying. So we turn off the machine. We, we, we don't instantly release the load. We let the load back off a little bit. As it does so, we notice it goes right back down this same line to a point where there's no load and no strain. No stress, no strain. We get right back down to the origin. That's, that's kind of, uh, that's very useful in that uh, uh, the, the material will go right up a linear, that's always the best kind of relationship to, to come across in science and physics and engineering because it's so easy to understand. We go right up that. If we release the load, we come right back down it, back down the very same line. We come back from our coffee break. Thanks, Frank. Appreciate that. Come back from our coffee break. Turn the machine back on. Let the load start going back up. Start increasing this P again. Start increasing the stress again. Notice what the response is. We go right back up the very same line. That's useful. It's extremely then predictable what the material is going to do. Whatever this material is in here, maybe it's A36 structural steel, whatever it is, it's very predictable what it's going to do. That's great to us as engineers. That means that we can choose a particular material, put it under load, we know what it's going to do. We know what's going to happen when that load is taken off. We know what's going to happen when that load's put back on. We know what the material's going to do. It makes the engineering a lot easier to do. Within limits. Within limits. We get up to some point, finally, 
where we start to lose the linear portion. We start to get the graph to curl over a little bit. Notice that that's a place of, of, of where, the, where the load's not increasing very much, so the stress isn't increasing very much, but the strain is increasing. Now the material is starting to give to that load. It's actually starting to stretch a little bit. Where we lose this linearity, we call that the yield stress. So we'll put a little sigma sub y here. That's where we start to get yield. That's a very important part to us, a point to us as engineers. If we want to keep the, the rep predictable response here, we need to stay under that stress if we want the material to yield predictably, lose any strain that it got in it as we take off the load and go back and forth, uh, up and down this line several times, then we need to stay below that yield stress. And if you look in your books, that's one of the items that the, uh, essentially the middle column calls it the yield strength, sigma sub y, gives it both tension, compression, and for shear, because we can redo the test as, as a shear test. So you've got some pretty good values. Notice for, for all the steels, they're the same uh, in compression as they are in tension. That's pretty good if we have if we have uh, of a structural piece that's going to be stretched and then compressed and then stretched and then compressed, it responds in the same way either side. So that's that can be kind of useful. All right. Since uh, since this is linear and predictable, we call this region the elastic region. The material is behaving exactly as a linear spring behaves. As we keep going a little bit, we start to get a curl over, at least for certain types of materials. These are, uh, we get a different curve from here on for every for, for different types of materials. For ductile materials, um, those that have this kind of response at room temperatures, which are most of our structural steels, are, are ductile materials. So let me let it go a little bit farther as we start to see the type of things it does. Bound in here, it tends to really increase the the uh, mechanical stretching of the material. So much so, it'll stretch so much so that it actually will reduce the load in here. It stretches so much that the machine now feels uh, uh, that there's quite a bit of stretching that's gone on. The jaws here have separated quite a bit to the point it actually reduces some of the load here. And then as we continue with the test, we see that it starts to come back up here. Um, Any time in here, from this yield point beyond, if we reduce, if we turn off the machine or completely take off the load, we never get back to down here. We've permanently, permanently now stretched the material. We'll never get it back. You've all seen that happen with springs. You stretch them too far, they'll never go back to their original length and you ruin them. That's why we don't let students play with springs in physics labs very much, because you ruin them. You get them out there, all the guys got to take the springs and they start doing this Charles Atlas thing and seeing who can bust the spring and who can't. And then if we take it a bit farther, 
we actually can get up above the previous stress limits to some point then where we peak out a little bit and come down and finally the material actually ruptures. That's the exciting part of the uh, experiment because it happens with an incredibly loud bang. Suddenly the material has separated here, physically separated, and the jaws now are at full load, but there's nothing holding them together anymore and they slam apart and makes a really loud bang. If you're standing next to the machine when it does that and the lab assistant didn't warn you it was going to happen, you're going to get ringing in your ears for the rest of your life. Thank you very much, lab assistant at Portland State University. If I knew your name, I'd sue you. Jake, you got a hand up? Um, like when the um, stress is increasing, like that second curve. In here? Yeah. Is that because the area is getting smaller? It's, it's part of it. Okay. That's, that's what's really happening out in this region. We call it necking. It's where the material is actually is, is physically thinning now, and so the area is starting to drop as the uh, as the load goes up. Obviously, this point is important. This is the ultimate stress. It's the most it can it can withstand. Uh, that kind of point, uh, generally, we don't want to do any engineering near that for our structures. We want to stay way back here where everything's elastic and recoverable and predictable. But there are times when you want a piece that you, you actually want it to fail because then it protects other more expensive components in the equipment. So you do need to sometimes engineer out of this region so that uh, a, a small, cheap, easily replaced part will fail, protecting then um, all the more expensive or harder to get to equipment. Uh, it's the type of thing, if you, uh, if you do any snow blowing, which most of us do, uh, uh, you've got those big augers in the front attached to an axle, and then there's shear pins holding in that auger. You want the, if, a, if a rock gets caught in those augers, you want the shear pins to fail rather than have these, those augers jam hard to a stop, slam the engine to a stop, and then the engine's ruined. Much nicer to lose a buck and a quarter on a shear pin than $500 on the engine of the snowblower. So it's that kind of idea that sometimes we do want to engineer, actually engineer in that region. So, um, sort of a, as a review, in this region we're actually seeing what we call yield. This region is called strain hardening. Because at any time, if you release the load there, turn off the machine or, or uh, unload the structure or whatever it is, you'll come back down to some, uh, some level where now there's some built-in strain to the material. Sometimes that's useful. Um, we're not going to look at that very much. We're going to look very much, uh, spend most of our concern and time in this elastic region. Now, to just give you some of the idea of the numbers, oh, by the way, ductile is uh, a material that will rupture at room temperature and follows this kind of curve. So that's most of the structural steels uh, that we'll be interested in as, uh, as engineers. You, you may end up in some, some part of the industry where you've got to worry a lot more about some of the other things going on. For the most part, we'll worry about just this elastic region. 
So let me just put some numbers on here to show you what we're talking about. These are numbers for a low carbon steel. A steel without very much carbon uh, in the uh, substructure. If you take a course called material science, you'll look at, at, at all, what makes an alloy, how they, how they do it, and uh, what the response of the material is to different alloying percentages and the like. So just to get some values in here for a, a common steel, this, uh, this uh, strain limit uh, on the yield is something like 0.012. And the yield strength is oh, up around maybe 40. These, uh, these values, by the way, KSI, kips per square inch, and then uh, we don't necessarily need units on the strain. This value here where we kind of hit a, a low point is 0.02. So you can see the, the scale difficulty of trying to get all this on the same drawing. This is very, very small compared to this. And so it's difficult to get uh, just to get the whole thing on a graph that's useful. And we'll talk about that in a second. This value out here being something like 0.2, and then rupture at around 0.25. So that's that's a pretty good amount of stretching there. That's a quarter inch over uh, one inch of material, and ultimate maybe up here around 60. So those are some of the numbers we're getting. Our book, uh, and because of that, we will not even deal with the rupture strength. It's only got listings for the yield strength, the end of the linear region, and this ultimate strength if you want to get out there to the, to the absolute, uh, absolute maximum. All right, uh, a quick look at some of the other kind of things that can go on. So we look at this, this stress strain curve. Uh, other materials that aren't ductile, for example, aluminum, will have a curve that looks a lot more like this. Again, a nice linear region. And then it tends to respond like that and then just reach a rupture point. It doesn't have this, this sort of dip into the curve that most of the steels have. And again, the, the real graph look more like that, where that linear region is indistinguishable from the y-axis if we did it uh, the same scale all the way across. If we go up to some point past this linear region, say up to here, and then release the load, we tend to come back down parallel to that original linear region, and it's sort of like the uh, the uh, material now starts over from there, and can go up or down now that line. So in a way, you've you've increased the yield, the, the yield limit. You've increased the point where the linearity stops because we're a little bit higher up here than we were down here, but you've permanently built in some strain offset, which might be exactly the kind of thing you want to do. It's not atypical to put in a 
permanent strain offset of about 0.2 percent for for aluminum to get a little bit more yield out of it than before. Um, other materials of interest. Um, ceramics and brittle materials, glass, brick, stone, they have not very much of a linear region and kind of just go up and then rupture. They're extremely useful in um, Compression, very uh, very hard to engineer in tension. So uh, a lot of a lot of uh, point of that is is ignored with those things. All right, so there's sort of a, a cartoon picture of, of the response of some of the materials to what we got going on here. Any question before we start looking at uh, some more detail, especially in this engineering region? of interest down here where things are so predictable and repeatable. All right, let's leave that graph up there because we're going to work some with that one. Oh, wait, before we do, let's, uh, let's take a quick peek at what the, the book does. How many of you have a book with you? Okay, so it is worth it if I put it up here on the projector. Just to see what they do with these. Uh, with these graphs. There's, there's different ways to handle this problem. The fact that that this region is incredibly small, and if we did the whole thing to the same scale, we wouldn't even see that line. So the book does a couple different things with it to make it so it's usable. Here's one of the, this, notice, here's the basic curve that I just sketched out first. More to the, the true scale of it. So what they've done is taken this linear region of interest and redrawn it to a different scale. And that's then what's shown in the light blue numbers. Notice that you can follow that with the light blue numbers all the way out to here, then that point stops and restarts on a different scale there. So that's one way to handle this problem, uh, to graphically handle the problem that is very, very difficult to get all of this on the same scale and make it usable and visible where we can see some, some actual numbers. So it's not really two different materials, two different tests. It's just this, this picture stretches out and then reverts back to a grosser scale starts again here and then finishes the curve. So that's the way, that's the, the main way our book handles this. So that was as good an example as any of them in here. So yeah, you can see other, other uh, problems where they do the very same thing. So I guess that's one of the few instances where it's okay to use color and graphics. My, uh, my students have had me before. Remember, I very seldom recommend that you ever use color on a graph, but that might be one of the places where it's worth it. The trouble is, of course, if that gets photocopied, then that, uh, the, the clarity of that is lost, and so you might want to do other things. One thing that could be done is to make two graphs out of this. 
where there's one graph for the elastic region, just like they did there with the lower portion of the, of the diagram. And then continue the graph now with a different scale that pushes this back into there, but then lets the rest of it go out. Uh, that's, that's sort of like what they did there, only taking this graph out from underneath and sliding it over here. That way you wouldn't have to use color uh, on these, and you can use a much different scale. on that graph and uh, it can still be obvious that the two went together. Maybe even continue a dotted line over to here to show that it continues. So there's different ways to handle it. Different books do different things. But the, again, the bulk of our concern is going to be with this linear region so that we can stay below the point where the structural materials start to yield. It could be that once they start to yield, remember this is actually a physical lengthening of the material, it could be that things don't fit quite right anymore. A machine might not run properly or uh, doors might stop closing if we're talking about structural members that, that undergo this type of stretching. Uh, all kinds of dastardly things can happen. So we're going to focus then on this linear region. Shouldn't be too much of a surprise that when we have a linear region like this, especially one that's so politely goes through the origin, which of course this does, if there's no load, there'll be no response to the material. It's just sitting there, you just got it out of the box, uh, no cars going across the bridge, whatever the situation might be. It shouldn't be a great surprise to you then that the slope of that line is very important. For different materials, there's a different slope there. This slope is known as Young's modulus. Of course, if it's Young's modulus, we give it the symbol E. Actually, that comes from the fact it's also known as the elastic modulus, because this is the elastic region in which uh, we're concerned. Remember the material will return directly back down that line if the load is relieved. So it's a, it's a perfectly elastic response. In fact, we'll see in a second uh, that you've actually been here before in, in, uh, in certain ways. So that's, that's the Stress at any point in the test divided by the strain at any point in the test. So it's stress over strain. We can do a little bit of simple mathematics on this. Uh, canceling like terms, top and bottom, we're left with S over AIM to simplify the uh, Simplify the ratio. But I'm bummed. What a bunch of old men. When I heard that 30 years ago, and this was also at Portland State University, I thought that was fun. In fact, I had to wait until I came here and taught this class the first time. I could finally use what might possibly be the greatest engineering joke ever. <laughs> well, actually, at the time, I thought it was. I've since learned some of my own that are even better. We haven't gotten to them yet, though. All right. Bunch of grumpy old men. That's the 
what I got in here. YouTube will be. So let's let's double check what we got here. That's that's uh, the stress over the strain. Now this is remember a material characteristic. This is something the manufacturer should publish. It's the type of thing, of course, that we can look up in the back of the book. Once it's been done for a particular material, it's considered uh, considered uh, 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 no different than density or or uh, color or even cost. It's a, a material characteristic that uh, the, the manufacturer should let you know about. Now let's. Let's, uh, let's just take this just for a second to show you that this is actually rather familiar to you. So I'll just do a little bit of uh, quick math to, to rearrange things a little bit. Let's see, is that the, uh, yeah, that's right. That's the piece I'm looking for. All right, so if I rearrange that just a little bit, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put P over here and everything else over there, which will be uh, E times A over L times del. That's, that's, that algebra is okay, I think. Here's why that's important. Notice that everything right here. What can you tell me about that quantity, EA over L? It's what? It, everything in there is a constant. Remember, this is a material characteristic. You tell me you have uh, A36 steel, I'll look it up. I know exactly what that is. The area is already determined by the piece. In this case, it was a test piece. But it could be a structural piece we have. L, that, remember, is the original length of the material. Then this is the variable response to some load. So I can rewrite this as F equals KX. That look familiar? It sure should. This is, of course, Hooke's Law for linear springs, just like you saw in physics class. Just to uh, further emphasize a couple things, one is that uh, especially this, this uh, Young's modulus is a constant as far as we're concerned. It's a design point that we can use in calculations, and that the material uh, response that we're talking about in here is indeed elastic because that's exactly what uh, you looked at when you looked at Hooke's Law with first springs, which you probably did. Uh, we didn't have to do it in Physics 1. I don't think you do it in Physics 2. Did you? Uh, actually, did Hooke's Law on some springs. You might because then you looked at harmonic motion and you need to know what K is for harmonic motion, so it might have been worth actually figuring out what K is. But it's such a simple simple experiment. You just hang increasing masses and measure the length of the spring as you go. Um, so we've got this, this uh, very predictable, very usable point uh, in terms of the material response itself, the material characteristics. So that, again, is a, a piece we're going to need in the books. So if you don't bring your book, at least photocopy this full inside, both of them, because one's the English table, one's the SI table, so that you have this with you at all times. Um, and then notice one of the things in there is, uh, let's see, second column, modulus of elasticity E. or elastic modules as I happen to write it. 
All right, let's put that to some use if we can. All right, so here's a, here's a simple uh, design of some kind uh, with which we might concern ourselves. There's a three-foot cable there holding up one end of a simply pinned beam. Two feet along here. So that'll be two feet, and this will be then another three feet. We hang a weight of some kind. In fact, you're going to have to determine what that is. That's, that's part of what we're going to do here, is determine what that is. Once that weight is put on there, the response of the system is a deflection caused by the stretching of that support cable there so that the system drops down to there. Just for, for help, we'll label a couple of these points for reference. A, B, C, what did I use? D, and E. So there's been a strain response in the support cable DE due to the load put on uh, there at point C. For now, however, we will not later have this luxury. For now, we're going to assume that that beam does not bend in any way. Not too long from now, we will look at the uh, response of uh, other of these structural materials. Right now we're only looking at tension and compression. The bending is due to a transverse load, so we'll be looking at that in a little bit. Alright, and this cable here is four feet long. Alright, you need to find a couple things. One, we're going to need to find the weight. Also want to find the, uh, the strain in both cables. We have one support cable at DE and one cable at BC holding the load itself, which we don't know yet. Both cables are A36 steel. couple other things you need. This downward displacement here is 0.025 inches. And the cables have a cross-sectional area Remember, that's important to us now because that's what uh, is determined, uh, used in the stress, cross-sectional area of 0, 0, square inches. All right, so we can get a start on this one, then we'll finish it up on uh, tomorrow morning. What's the easiest thing to find, the thing that we can find almost right off, right off the start? We've got to find three things. The strain in the two cables, the one cable we have here, the one cable we have here, and then we also need to find out what is the load is that will cause this uh, system to respond in this way. T 
DJ, what you said? It's a strain in the cable that you need. The strain in this cable is easy to find. You've got everything you need there to find that right away. Is there any strain in cable BC? In cable BC? Yeah. We've got a weight hanging from it. I bet there's a strain in it. So there is a delta. Mm -hmm. I don't know what. Now remember, when if, if it's a concern how much this load moves, don't forget there's strain in the cable and a deflection there too, if that was a concern. We have to look at both of those things. All right, double check. I gave you all the pieces. Uh oh, that's not the mood. No. Frank doesn't have an energy drink. What is that? Uh, elasticity is 29 times 10 to the third. Yeah, Be careful. Make sure that. Not only do you use the right set of units, whether it's SI or English, but that you also read the table properly. Most of these are in uh, most of these these elastic modulus numbers are fairly large. Most of your game plan there with that one. 